Hello there, and thank you for joining me. I'm Pastor J. Dylan Proctor. I'm out here with the Bronco, which is used in the Bronco Bible study, and we're going to be having a revival and Bible study that looks at history, that we can better prepare ourselves to contend for the gospel in the world around us. There's a lot of crazy things going on, and we need to understand history, really where we came from and where God wants us to go. And throughout this, I want our prayer to be that we can have revival through revelation. And I mean that both including the book there in the New Testament, but also revelation with the lowercase r, how the Holy Spirit comes to us to convict us, to reveal things to us that may not always be obvious in the world around us. So we're going to begin today with a couple of scriptures. We're going to look at some stories throughout history. You can hear the sounds of nature, even the sound of the motorcycles going by, and we're going to have a great time. Let's open up by listening to the third chapter, or excuse me, the third epistle of John, chapter 1. It's just the one chapter, verse 11, which says, Imitate that which is good, not that which is evil. And we're going to come back to that, but let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I ask that you be with us today, that we could come together, that we could have our hearts and minds opened up, that you would reveal to us, reveal to us the truth there within your scriptures, reveal with us the, the truth of how we should live in the world around us. Bless us, let us be people of grace and peace who understand that we should reflect your grace and also contend for all that is good, true, and beautiful in the world around us, that we may enjoy peace and we may love our neighbors and snatch those who are lost from the jaws of hell. We ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, let's begin today with a little bit of history, shall we? We know a lot about the American Revolution. We hear a lot of different things out there. Today, I want us to talk about a young lady whose name was Sybil Ludington. Now, Sybil Ludington, she's known a lot for being kind of the 16-year-old uh, lady version of Paul Revere. And the reason why is she had this night ride where there were a bunch of British soldiers coming to capture a town. And her father, he was an important man. He was a colonel. And he didn't have time to go out and get his men together. And his daughter, his 16-year-old daughter, Sybil, she went on this night ride to go and round the men. And while that's a wonderful story, we're going to actually be talking about another part of Sybil's life. Because, you see, as I mentioned earlier, her father was someone who was really important in the American Revolution. He was a man who owned a, grit, a grist mill. He didn't really have a lot of, you know, accoutrements in the world. He wasn't somebody who had all the titles and things like that that we might expect through British nobility. But he was a man who owned a business and he had a good way of making a life. And he put all of that on the line in order to fight for a cause that he thought was worthy. And we'll find throughout history, those who really move the needle towards anything good and true, they're not just people who are here to hold things together or people who are here to be someone really important, but they're people who are willing to make a point. They're people who are willing to stand for all that is good and true, even if that costs them everything in the world around. Well, Sybil, her father was someone who had really put a lot of things on the line, and there were a lot of British who were after him. And they had sent spies, they had sent all sorts of people to go and capture him and kill him. Well, Sybil got word that they were coming to attack and hunt for her father. And she had several siblings, several that were younger than her. And when they were coming to attack their house, she realized that the soldiers were coming. And there really wasn't a lot they could do because there weren't any soldiers of their own. There weren't any American patriots there at the house that were trying to, to defend against the army. And she was just there with her siblings. And she was wondering, what in the world can I do about this? And we oftentimes in our own lives, we wonder, how can we stand against the wiles of evil around us? We, we feel like we're outnumbered. It seems like every institution around us is turned against us. What can we do to stand for all that is good, true, and beautiful? Well, Sybil had this problem herself. And mind you, she's not even 16 years old yet. She's much younger. She's just a young teenager. But an idea struck Sybil. She said, you know what? We don't have to actually be an army to deter the British. In fact, what we can do is... If I set a candle up in my room at night, what we can do is I'll take myself and my siblings, my brothers and sisters, and we'll march past a window, we'll duck down and we'll run up under the window and then we'll march past it again. And she with her siblings, they again of their varying heights, they took their turn and they would march in front of the window, duck down and run around and they would march again and again. And they did this. And 
As it so happened, those British spies who were watching it on the house who were hoping to bring their army and attack, they actually made a scene where it looked like the house was filled with soldiers. Those kids who were just walking in front of the window, they would duck down and they would walk again in front of the candlelight. They made it appear as if the house was filled with soldiers and therefore the British turned and ran. And that's an example of heroism where Sybil, she really was a woman of courage and conviction even as a young teenager. And while she didn't have a real army behind her, she did find victory. And I want us to think for a moment, we in the church, we should never be afraid to contend for the biblical worldview. You know, sometimes I'm worried that there are people out here who are worried that the biblical worldview won't win. That if we stand up for the, the good things of Christ, then what if the devil beats us? We should never fear for that. Christ came to us and told us, I have come, I have overcome everything in the world. You know, I want us to go back to the epistles of John, but I want to go to the first epistle of John. And I want to go to 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. And in that it says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now, when we think about that, that battle, which was avoided there with Sybil Ludington, you know, she was marching in front of the window. She didn't really have an army at her back. But when we fight for the things of God, we do have the armies of God behind our back. We have Christ behind our back. We should not be shy about anything because the victory is behind us. And one might even make the case, those who were fighting the American Revolution, they were wanting to go all the way back to that Mayflower Compact, which opens up and says, in the name of God, for the glory of God, and for the advancement of the Christian faith. They were doing something which was hoping to create a nation where you could live out your faith between you and God without the tyrannies of the world telling you how to do that. And Sybil found victory that night. How much more we should find victory every day when we understand Christ is with us. You know, continuing on with our scripture readings from the epistles of, of John, I want to go back to 1 John and look in chapter 5, which opens up and it says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him, also that is begotten of him. Now, I know all of that language there in Old English, I'm reading from the King James, it can sound a little bit confusing, but what this is telling us is that when we love God the Son, we love God the Father. When we look at the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, these are not three separate persons who are all opposed to one another. These three persons of the Holy Trinity, they are in agreement with one another. You're not going to find God the Holy Spirit telling you something different than God the Father. You're not going to find Jesus doing something which is against God the Father. They come together in unity, and not just for unity's sake, but for the cause of all that is good. When God comes to us and He creates the heavens and the earth, He declares His creation to be good at the end of each day because God alone makes the good, and it's God's motivation to take things to a place that is good. Continuing on in 1 John 5, 2, it says, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. And for this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? We're in a day and age, folks, where... The wiles of hell, they really have come to attack us. We have to understand that there's a lot of people who believe they're atheistic or agnostic. They're really not. And I hope there's even people listening to this message today that might be of that, that position where they're not really sure, is there truth out there? A lot of people feel like the things that I've trusted in in life have failed me. You know, the things which gave me hope, they, they failed me. We have to understand that we as creatures, we are hardwired to be religious about everything we do. When you go into Walmart and you see those vests that the employees wear and on the back of it, it says so many bottles were used to make this vest. You know, the, so many water bottles were recycled to make this or that. 
We may not recognize it at first, but that's a moral statement. It's ultimately meant to be a statement about a belief system. You've satisfied the good because you've recycled. Whenever people get separated from God, they start to be religious about everything else. We've seen this. Politics is largely religious nowadays. People have their religious tribes about politics, and that's not something God designed us to do. And we have to understand that there are things which are good, there are things which are bad, things which need to be enhanced, things which need to be rejected. But when our world comes and makes everything religious that's not meant to be, like having a vest and having a religious statement on the back of that, it's sort of the green earth uh, religious movement which has been with us throughout time. You've always had some form of paganism that is interested in worshiping the earth. And now in the modern day and age, it may not have the official temples, but it's woven itself in through a lot of the sciences and it's kind of moved away from a pursuit of truth and instead a pursuit of morality. And for a lot of people who are lost, people who are atheistic or agnostic in their confessions, well, they go out and they put on their vest and it doesn't really change who they are. They, they buy into all of these statements that our world throws out there and they begun to begin to believe that believing in something really doesn't matter. It's all nothing. You know, the people over there at the church, their God must be nothing. To the Holy Spirit, there must be nothing to it either because there was nothing into me putting the can in the recycling bin. It didn't really make me feel that different. This is a big problem that we need to talk about, and especially when we're talking about overcoming the world. We have to first acknowledge that the world is indeed setting up false religions all around us. And when I say religion, I don't just mean something where people go once a week, but really false belief systems, false moralities by which one should live by. And we have to contend against these things. We need to start teaching people that, hey, there actually is stuff in the world that will bring you meaning. When you go back to the order of creation, the true sciences, you get back to truth as we find there in Genesis. God comes and he creates the natural law. There will be a, a day, there will be a night. There will be birds in the sky, fish in the sea. There will be creeping things which creep about the earth. And hey, I'm even going to make one creature in my image. They'll be made male and female. There's a natural law to that. They come together and they have unity. They have peace. They come together as a new covenant with one another. There's beautiful things in how God created us and we need to elevate these things and point to the real meaning that is there. Because it's not just something to choose if one wants to or not, but it's a battle. It's a spiritual battle that is ripping apart our world. It is much darker than we could ever imagine. You know, we can think back to the American Revolution and you can clearly see the soldier outside Sybil Ludington's window and then you can clearly see the children walking back and forth. We can think about that in real tangible, understandable terms. But where we're at in this modern day and age is the wiles of evil have gotten really, really clever. They're all out there and they're very obvious if you want to see them and they're oftentimes very abrupt, like putting words on the back of a jacket or a vest. But at the same time, they try to play the game where they say, well, we're not really a religion, we're not really a belief system, but they, they really are. So there's a lot of things that I want us to accomplish out here in our, our Bible studies. One, I want us to be people who are praying for revelation. And one of the key aspects of that is discernment. We need to understand that the gospel, it is a victory. It is begging for us to let it out of the cage, for men and women to step into the good, the true, and the beautiful, to say we want to pull people from the wiles of evil. We want to liberate people from the insanity of the world, the untruth, the unreason that is going on in the world around us. We want to pull people from that so that they can walk in liberty, so that they can have freedom, so that they can return back to how God designed us to live. In our Bible study, we're going to be learning some techniques on how we can memorize Scripture. We opened up today with 3 John 11, and the reason I wanted us to begin there, and I'll read that verse again, and I'm going to read it in the King James. It says, Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. Now first, let's talk a little about a little bit about good and evil. In modern English, we tend to use the word good to refer to something which is remotely positive. We might look over here at this bronco and say, well, the body is bad, 
kind of has a little bit of a charm to it like it's been in the apocalypse but we also might look at it and say the engine is good in fact of all the vehicles I've owned this is the fastest starting vehicle I've ever owned it drives extraordinarily well mechanically this Bronco is extremely sound you would look at it and a lot of people are surprised that it runs but in fact the engine the transmission the gearbox the rear end is all in immaculate shape but is it good is this over here good I've got a shirt on that says the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. What is it that might make a man good? What would make a woman good? Well, first off, good does not just mean that the engine runs well. Good does not just mean that someone does something that is pleasing or positive. For something to be good, it has a connection to God and God's natural order, God's natural law, the proper way of living, the proper order of the universe. And as John is talking there, when he says that which is good, he doesn't just mean something which is positive or something which is, you know, got good paint on it still or something that runs well as a machine. He's talking about things which are truly morally good. They're in accordance with what God has called us to do. And then he juxtaposes that with evil. And evil is not just something which is bad, like bad paint. Evil is something which is outside the created order. It's something which is improper. It's unwell. There's a little bit of something which is ill and sick to it. And John reminds us there that if you want to be a man or woman of God, imitate, reflect, live in accordance, do what is good. And this is something which might sound simple, but is something which we in the church really need to learn. Very often in life, people in the church want to be relevant to the world. But being relevant is something which is a reward. It's in effect, it's not a cause. If something like this Bronco, if it's a good vehicle, well then it's relevant to me as transportation. If it's something which doesn't run, then it's no longer relevant to me as transportation. It's just a old beat up truck that is quite frankly, scrap metal. For something to be relevant means it has earned that place of relevancy. And one of the things which is quite interesting is that those who pursue to be relevant as a goal, they're not relevant to the world. But those who pursue to do something meaningful, to declare the gospel, well then suddenly that actually has some power. It has earned relevancy. You know, when we look there throughout the gospel, you know, I've been doing a Wednesday night study at the church where I pastor on the book of Acts. And we find that there's a lot of people who want to kill the early Christians. There are some who want to kill Stephen, and they do. There are many times they try to kill the Apostle Paul. The reason why they want to kill Stephen and Paul and many others is because those Christians, they have become relevant in the world around them. They're doing something meaningful. They cannot be ignored. But Paul, Stephen, the many other apostles, the disciples, those who were faithful there in the church, they didn't desire relevancy for the sake of relevancy. Instead, they desired the gospel. They desired God. And out of those motivations, not just intentions, not just outcomes, but motivations. You know, intentions are what we would like to see happen. Outcomes are what actually happen. But when we look at Scripture, we find out that God doesn't really care what you wanted to have happen or how you got somewhere, but He cares why you did things. Where was your heart at in those moments? We in the church need to have motivations. If we want to be people who actually make an impact in the world around us, then we have to be motivated to serve God. Not just motivated to be relevant, but motivated to serve God first, and then down the stream we'll find that relevancy. When we find here in 3 John 11, what we find is a formula that says, look to God for how you behave, how you speak, and how you think. In the pursuit of being relevant, there's a lot of, of people in the church who adopt the language, the topics, the talking points of the world. You know, we want to sound like the world. We want to talk about the topics of the world. We should not do that. You know, as we find there in the uh, third chapter of Revelation, those who I, I love, I rebuke and chastise, as Jesus tells there to the church, we should not sound like the world when we speak. We don't need to use the vocabulary of the world. Instead, we should be using the vocabulary of Scripture. And today, 
I want us to do some, some exercises that help build our biblical literacy and our ability to memorize Scripture. I know I want to be someone who is able to memorize Scripture better and better. And even in my pastoral walk, I'm still a young man, but I've been pastoring for almost 10 years now. The older I get, the more the Holy Spirit comes to mature me, the more I find that I'm able to, to remember Scripture. But it doesn't happen by accident. It takes a lot of work. It takes me a lot of work. And one of the things which God has done that really helps me, one of the things that the Holy Spirit has really taught me, is that if I want to memorize a Scripture, one of the best tools I can have is to write that Scripture down. Write it down with my, my hand and an ink pen, and it kind of sits in my brain a little bit better. So I invite you to do this with me. The scripture that we're really looking at today is from the third epistle of John, verse 11. And there's just one chapter in third John, so it's just that 11th verse. But I want us to write down. And so I'm going to do that, and I invite you to follow along with me, because this is something which really will help our mind. We need to be imitating the good things of God. We need to be speaking with the biblical language. And when we write down and we start memorizing Scripture, that really will help us along that way. So 3 John 11. And if you'd like to write 111, that's also acceptable. I sometimes do that. If you use online resources like Bible Gateway, you have to clarify the chapter. And it says, Beloved, Follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth evil Excuse me, I'm reading and that's why we have to write things down and do it slowly. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. All right, and I've wrote it down in my little notebook. And I know for me, the next time this scripture comes up, I'm going to remember standing out here in my yard, my little dog Baron, I was hoping he would come over here and join us. He has dug up quite the hole over there, about 10 yards to my left. But just write that scripture down, and I invite you to do this. And, you know, I'll remember doing it out here. The next time I hear that scripture, I'm going to remember the sounds, the smells of everything out here. It'll all come together. We have to understand that we in the church are called to be people who are discerning of truth. And going back to an earlier statement I had, I want us to be praying for revival through revelation. The world around us, it is competing for people's hearts and minds. I think a miscalculation we've had in the church is that only Christianity is out there contending for the lost souls. That's not true. The wiles of hell want to secure people. The devil didn't just throw up his arms and say, hey, a whole nation has decided to be atheist and agnostic. I guess we'll pack up and go back home because everything is in the tank. No. God comes to us with provenient grace, this attitude that says, I'm going to be working in you even before you come to know me. Well, hell has done something similar. Hell has come to people and say, I want to build a moat around your life so that when you hear truth, you'll reject it. I want to be proveniently giving your mind things to accuse the good with so that when you see something good, you'll call it out and say, that is evil over there. You'll be confused morally. The devil has been working to morally confuse people and to build up fortifications around them where they really are ensured to be lost forever. And we in this church, we must realize this. We must realize we're contending not just against other people, but against powers and principalities. God realized this, and He came to this earth that we might find salvation, that we might be blessed. 
So I want us to be thinking on how we can find that goodness. I want us to be looking at history. People like Sybil Ludington, who was willing to go out on a limb, do some things which are a little bit risky, even be creative in how she stood against evil. Yeah, when she gets 16 year old, she has this phenomenal ride through the night and she does something which blesses a lot of people. But even before then, she was being creative in how she might figure out ways to stand against evil. And just from the earthly aspect of that, we know that a few people willing to do something good can do something that's powerful enough to scare away a real army. How much more we can do in the church when we allow the Holy Spirit to come into our lives? So often we think, if I'm going to go fight against you know, another army, I need to have all the answers. I need to have all the wisdom. But the truth is, we don't actually have to have all the answers. We don't have to have the magic words, the magic conjuration of, of speech that will cause the wiles of evil to admit they're evil and then go back home. But what we do have to have on our side is the Word of God. And that's not something which is a magic conjuration, but instead it is something which is eternal. It's something which is transcendent. It's larger than us. It is something which is unmoved. We can grab onto it and it can be our firm foundation. We need a firm foundation. We don't need something which changes with every direction of the wind. We need something solid, something that won't rust away and get beat up like this old Bronco. And the Word of God is that for us. And with our discipline, if we'll spend time learning to, to quote Scripture, learning to have Scripture come and rest in our mind, then we will find that we'll start speaking like that. We'll be imitating which is that which is good and not that which is evil and of the world. And with that, whenever we do go to contend, the Holy Spirit will be with us. We shouldn't be afraid, but instead we should be encouraged, invigorated, and looking for that victory with God. So I thank you for spending time with me. We're going to be looking throughout a lot of Bible chapters and books and things throughout this study, and a lot of characters throughout history. We'll be looking at the book of Revelation and some other interesting pieces of Scripture like First and Second Peter. And throughout all of this, I want us to be men and women who are fervent in our faith and look to bring others with us to the kingdom of God. So let's close today, shall we, by saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever. Amen. And as we close, I'm going to see if I can get Baron to come over here so that we can see him. Baron! Come here, buddy. Baron! Come here, Baron! Doggy! Baron! At least he did get behind the camera over there where we can see him. Baron, come here, buddy. Come here. Come over here and say goodbye to the people on camera. Say, so this is one excitable little dog here, and this is the dirtiest little dog I think I've ever owned. And there he is. Baron, can you say goodbye to those online? He says, maybe. He's looking at this Bronco saying, Daddy, why don't we go for a ride? Well, thank you all for joining me. And I'll catch you next time.